Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Chicago Appleseed and the Chicago Council of Lawyers annual Police Accountability Forum. Um, today, we're co-sponsored by the American Constitution Society, um, the Chicago Lawyers Chapter. So we're going to be talking about a lot of things today related to police use of force, police accountability, what's happening with policing in Chicago and the future of policing in Chicago. And to guide us through this discussion, we will have three panelists. We'll have first Professor Craig Futterman, who is the director of the Police Accountability Project at the University of Chicago Law School with the Mandel Legal Aid Clinic. Um, and he'll present first. And then after that, we'll be hearing from Professor Sheila Beatty, who's the director of the Community Justice and Civil Rights Clinic at Northwestern's Law School. And then finally, we'll be hearing from the Chief Administrator of COPA, which is the Civilian Office of Police Accountability here in Chicago, Sydney Roberts. And so while these three presenters are presenting, we encourage you to submit any questions you may have, any things that you want to talk about further um, on the link that was sent to you, um, which is www.collaborationforjustice.org slash police dash accountability dash forum if you didn't get that. Um, and we'll be picking from those questions for about an hour of Q&A that we have afterwards. So send those questions in at any time, not just when it gets to the Q&A portion. Um, and we might not have time to get to every single question, but we'll definitely try our best. So be sure to submit those. Um, and yeah, we'll be having about 10 minutes to hear from each of the presenters, and then we'll have about an hour to discuss more freely afterwards. So. I'm going to turn it over to Craig now. There's going to be a very brief break just as we get the screen sharing set up, and then you'll be hearing from him, and I'll come back in about half an hour to share your questions with the panelists. So thanks for joining us. The murder of Ahmad Arbery hit me especially hard. I mean, he was just jogging. Um, it, it's not like I wasn't viscerally aware of the ongoing reality of racism when I watched that video of those white men hunt down and murder another young black man, this time for jogging in a white neighborhood. But that knowledge doesn't make the pain of racism hurt any less. And I honestly gotta say, it knocked me off my feet. Um, I couldn't function for days. Similarly, I, I couldn't sleep after I witnessed George Floyd's murder. Weeks later now, I continue to struggle after seeing the video of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin press his knee on George Floyd's neck with his hands in his pocket, protected by his police partners while he stares directly into that camera in a crowd of people without a care in the world for eight minutes and 46 seconds. As Mr. Floyd repeatedly begs for his life, please, sir, I can't breathe calls for his mom, and then is unable to say anything at all. Still haunted by that image. Tens of thousands of people around the world have taken to the streets in protest now for weeks. And I think back to the powerful protest about four years earlier, right here in Chicago after our clinic, together with attorney Matt Topic, won a court order that forced the release that forced the mayor to release that horrific video of Officer Jason Van Dyke firing 16 shots into the body of 17-year-old Laquan McDonald as he lay helpless in the street. Young people took to the streets, shut down Chicago's magnificent mile on Black Friday, busy shopping day of the year, shouting 16 shots in a cover-up, and the entire world took notice. But as much as things have changed over four years, some things feel all too much the same. Some CPD data, some of which Gordon shared. The number of times police have shot people has went down significantly. At the time Van Dyke murdered Laquan, the Chicago Police Department was shooting nearly one person every week. According to COPA, officers now shoot at community members about one time per month. Our own research shows far more police shootings than COPA reports, but it still confirms a significant downward trend. Officers reported use of force also significantly has gone down. There were about 4,000 instances of police self-reported violence when the video was released back in 2015 as, appeared to, as compared to 2,700 instances last year. That's about a 30% decrease. However, lots of evidence that even with respect to this, the police officers aren't filling out use of force reports, a part of the code of silence, part of the power of the pen, control of the paper, control of the narrative, making, in essence, complaints, instances of police violence disappear. 
For example, we've seen video of more video of more than 50 baton strikes by the Chicago Police Department during the last weekend of May alone at the protests, including 26 while people who were beaten while they were still on the ground after they were already on the ground by police with batons. And in contrast to that video evidence, CPD officers reported in their official reports only three baton strikes in the entire month of May. Misconduct complaints also decreased during this time. 2007, about a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago, there were nearly 10,000 complaints, 9,500 complaints of CPD abuse. 2018, there are about 4,000, according to OIG Office Inspector General data. That's less than <coughs> half the number of complaints as about a decade ago. And focusing on the time of the protests following the release of the video of the execution of Maquam to just last year, we've seen about a 20% reduction in complaints. But while overall police violence has appeared to decrease in the past four years following the increased public scrutiny of the department, one thing hasn't changed, racism. Chicago Police Department continues to kill, beat, and harass black folks at grossly disproportionate rates as whites. Just as before, more than three quarters of the people who are shot and killed by police are black in Chicago. That's remained true for more than the past 30 years. Nearly 90% of the documented instances of police violence continue to be perpetrated against black and brown people. Black folks continue to be four times more likely to be abused by police in Chicago. Black women, 10 times more likely to be subjected to police violence in Chicago than white women. And get this, black women are two times more likely to be subject to police violence in Chicago than white men. The appalling reality today that a young black man in Chicago may have greater chance of dying at the hands of police than by COVID-19. So, I mean, is it surprising that the protests that have escalated, have escalated from those of just four years ago, is surprising that people are even more angry, more frustrated, more pain than ever. I'm grateful to be here and Gordon asked that I specifically talk a little bit about the Citizens Police Data Project and a case that we won last week before the Illinois Supreme Court and how that relates to our reckoning here around police violence in Chicago. And I'm gonna to try to take a quick stab because as y'all can relate, I, I can't say no to Gordon. The work that led to the creation of this database, the Citizens Police Data Project, it began about 20 years ago in Stateway Gardens, the public housing community that made up about eight square blocks on Chicago's South Side, part of the greatest concentration of public housing and poverty in the entire United States, and also true to Chicago's both past and present, um, an entirely segregated community. Everyone who lived at Stateway was black. My students and I spent seven years from a vacant garden apartment at Stateway, working in partnership with families who lived there fighting systemic human rights abuses in our own backyard. And it was there that we learned exactly what impunity looked and felt like from the ground. We got to know over our time there a woman by the name of Diane Bond, then a 50 year old public school janitor, mom of three sons. Over the course of about a year, she was repeatedly sexually abused by a group of officers known on the streets as a skull cap crew for the watch caps that they wore on their heads. We sued the skull cap crew, but not just the crew, we also sued the city. We brought a systemic suit and challenged the system. And a part, as a part of that, we fought and won access to years of police misconduct complaints in Chicago and their investigations. And you know what we saw exactly how groups of racist and sadistic officers like the Skullcap crew have been able to operate with impunity in black communities like Stateway Gardens. The problem was that we got all that information under protective order that we weren't allowed to share. So after many, many years of litigation, um, fast forward 2014, we established the legal principle in Illinois that police misconduct records belong to the people. And it's one thing to win a lawsuit, and it's another thing to bring it home. To bring it home, um, this legal pressing, to make it real, we launched in partnership with the Invisible Institute what's now known as the Citizens Police Data Project, what we like to call CPD Group. A public database gives everybody, ordinary people, researchers, lawyers, journalists, policymakers, organizers, advocates, people struggling in prison, everyone, all of us, with access to information about every single police misconduct complaint in Chicago. Never been anything like this in our history in the United States. We're talking about a fundamental redistribution of power from the police to ordinary people. 
People have used CPDB to win their freedom, to prosecute civil rights violations by police, to uncover patterns of police abuse. The Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Justice itself relied on it to document the police department's pattern and practice of civil rights violations. Most importantly, ordinary people and communities most impacted by police abuse have used it to challenge systemic police violence against Black, Brown, and poor folks right here in Chicago. It's become a critical tool in the fight for community oversight of the police department. Among the powerful things that I actually witnessed in the protest, um, as Chicago police officers, as she will, will share, repeatedly beat and abused people for protesting police violence, I saw people witnessing police abuse pull up CPDP on their phones to call out officers' names and the number of misconduct complaints against them. I don't think it's any coincidence that instances of Chicago police use of force, brutality complaints and shootings have went down since public scrutiny of the police has increased when officers know that people are watching and acting, that the real power for change resides with people in our communities. At the same time we fought to make these records public though, we experienced powerful backlash embodied by the FOP, the police union, and the Trump administration. <clears throat> the FOP and Trump continues to fight any police oversight or, or public scrutiny of the police in Chicago, including the federal consent decree that she will talk about in a minute. As part of that backlash, the FOP fought to destroy hundreds of thousands of the very police misconduct records we fought to make public. The FOP contract that they've long negotiated behind closed doors requires the destruction of most police misconduct records that are more than five years old. But just last week, we won a big victory that Gordon asked me to share in the Illinois Supreme Court, which affirmed the principle that public records belong to and must be maintained for the benefit of the people of Illinois. And specifically, the Supreme Court held that provisions of the, those provisions of the FOP contract that require Destruction of police misconduct records, the void, they're unenforceable because they're contrary to fundamental Illinois public policy. And that's a really important precedent that the city and the, the FOP have no right to bargain away police accountability or transparency to the people of Chicago. Can not agree in private outside of public view to bargain away police accountability to the community? That just shouldn't be on the table. And while I'm proud of the win, um, we can't leave this because right now there are backroom negotiations and arbitrations going on between the FOP and city in secret behind closed doors. <clears throat> so we need a permanent solution. We need to challenge those FOP provisions and ask everybody to push their own representative center in Illinois to pass legislation now, for example, that requires permanent retention of these police misconduct records. Now, I'd love to give a quick tour of our database and also share some observations on police use of force policies and my experience as a member of the community working group, but I know I need to wrap up and I'm glad to share more about that if folks want in the Q&A. Um, but let me stop on just a couple of observations in closing. Two things have given me real, real hope in this moment. First, through my own pain, I see real beauty and hope in the hundreds of thousands of people around the world and in Chicago who continue to lift their voices together to affirm that Black Lives Matter. People of all races, genders, ages, social statuses, protesting police violence and demanding change. If there's anything that we learned in our many years fighting racism, conditions of police impunity, institutional denial, secrecy, is that the police department here in Chicago isn't going to change on its own, Things don't change unless we make them change. Strangely though, I found a second reason for hope in the midst of this painful and deadly pandemic. And that's that one of the things this pandemic has done is make us all stop. To stop so many of the things we've taken for granted, how we do things, how we organize our lives, grind it to a halt. The basic law of momentum dictates you gotta stop. We gotta stop before we're able to change directions. And this force stop, it provides each and every one of us with an opportunity. And that's the opportunity to question what we've done, to ask whether it makes sense to continue doing it. She will talk about even thinking about defunding and, and fundamental change, thinking about how we can do stuff better. So we stand at a safe social distance today and it's so awkward, but not just in the midst of this COVID pandemic, but we also find ourselves in a parallel moment, brutally awake to yet another reminder that no matter how many times that we shout that Black Lives Matter, Millions of people in our society remain incapable of seeing black folks as fully human. And the reality too, sadly, is that many of them are still police officers. Racism persists, 
we have to stop before we can change directions. Good afternoon, everyone. I am really honored to be following uh, my friend and comrade, Craig. Um, we have uh, spent a lot of time together over the years and I've learned so much from him um, about holding CPD accountable. And he was characteristically modest, uh, but so much of what we know about CPD, about the lack of accountability, um, is because of the work that he and others have done in collaboration with, with Black communities. So I'm, I'm honored to be on, the, on this panel with him. Um, and as he mentioned, I'm going to talk about the, the consent decree that he and I and, and a number of other civil rights lawyers in town have been, have been working on uh, for about three years right now. And I'm going to start my comments related to the consent decree uh, by talking about one of our clients, uh, Arewa Winter. And Arewa is the founder of an organization related to Black Lives Matter Chicago called Justice for Families. Um, and Justice for Families is a, is a community of family members of people who have been killed, murdered by the Chicago Police Department. Uh, Arewa herself lost her 16-year-old nephew uh, who was shot and killed by the Chicago Police Department in 2016. Now, Arewa has been um, a longtime activist, but the death of her nephew really radicalized her. And she and a number of the other community uh, leaders who've been involved in the consent decree effort have, have spent hundreds of hours in conference rooms um, over the weekend with me and Craig and the other lawyers um, crafting demands around, around policing, um, doing this on top of her job that she works to get paid. She's been doing this completely as a, as a volunteer um, on top of caring for her family. Um, and what Arewa and our other clients have had to do to engage in this consent decree process um, is to really learn a number of legal concepts, things like intervention, things like Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sydney Roberts. I'm with the Civilian Office of Police Accountability. Um, we had a little technical difficulty, so I'm gonna slide in and uh, Sheila's spot um, and get started and she'll be with us in a few minutes. Um, I wanted to take a minute to, to uh, thank the Council of Lawyers for inviting me um, and to be able to sit here um, next to or be with uh, two distinguished police accountability advocates is really an honor for me. Um, and I wanna open by saying, um, you know, like, like Craig said, what's happening in this country, um, particularly in the city of Chicago, it, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Um, and yes, police accountability is not a new subject, but I too am more optimistic about the prospect of change today than, than I've ever been. The death of George Floyd was not the first time that I saw a video of a black man killed at the hands of, of police. However, it was the most recent event that, that's just shaken me to my core. As part of COPA's investigative due diligence, we review videos of police shootings and, and, and beatings um, frequently, far too frequently. But what I witnessed in the manner in which George Floyd was, was, was killed, it, it affected me differently. It affected me differently for two reasons. As a black mother, what I witnessed served to affirm that I'm not naive or misguided in the fact that my greatest fear is that my son will be killed at the hands of law enforcement. But the glare in that officer's eyes as he showed everyone the power that he had over life and death chilled me to the bone. And I have never witnessed that before. In 2017, I made the conscious decision to leave law enforcement, to become a part of the solution, to change the way policing is carried out in the United States. And it was my desire to ensure that government sanctioned force by police was lawful. And if it was not, that people would be held, the officers would be held accountable. But let me be clear, an oversight and accountability process or system alone 
does not equate to police reform. That alone is not going to stop unjustified uses of force. Police reform is a comprehensive set of measures of which oversight and accountability is but one component. Craig mentioned racism. Police accountability, police reform starts at home through the eradication of racism, through an appreciation and respect for the lives of other people who don't look like you. It starts with an internalized belief that black lives matter. And let us never forget that this country was built on the fundamental belief that black lives did not matter. And that law enforcement was built around that construct. Police reform includes ensuring that those trained to serve as police officers are trained to see themselves as problem solvers, to see themselves as service providers to the community. And when engaged in the enforcement of laws, they do so in a procedurally just manner, respecting the sanctity of life at all times. And most importantly, a law enforcement engagement that ends in the use of force is a failed operation, period. Use of force training should not focus exclusively upon teaching law enforcement to survive the violent encounter. Use of force training should be focused more on preventing that violent encounter from occurring in the first place. And that's what's meant by cultural change. Police reform is about eradicating the current law and order culture of policing and replacing it with a culture grounded in maintaining the police, ma sorry, maintaining peace. I mean, if police officers respond to a call with an understanding that their primary purpose is to bring about a peaceful resolution rather than to instill law and order, I believe we would have a different outcome. The cultural change to shift from a policing style of oppression to one designed to bring about peace, for me, it is daunting. But I'm more inspired today than ever before. For too long, there have been too few fighters that themselves were not victims of the police. Today, seeing the faces of the protesters, the outrage of the unimpacted community, the swift response to prosecute, to change laws locally and federally, that gives me inspiration that my fears as a mother may in fact one day be something different. Through that optimism and until reform has been achieved and even when after, there must still be a viable, incredible oversight and accountability system to ensure an officer's use of force is congruent with policies and policies that are supportive of the community's values. And so it's important when we think of police reform that we bear in mind first, police reform can't happen with just a civilian oversight and accountability system. Second, police reform can't happen without a civilian oversight and accountability system. And that oversight must have the ability to conduct investigations. And thirdly, even when policing is reformed, we still will need a civilian oversight and accountability system to provide trust and legitimacy to the actions of law enforcement. Chicago's history of oversight and accountability is long and it remains imperfect, but improvements in our oversight, in our investigation, and in our impact upon the department have been made. We have not landed where we need to be or where we want to be, but we are moving in the right direction. Following the killing of Laquan McDonald, many of the recommendations raised in the Police Accountability Task Force report, as well as the, as the DOJ report, have been incorporated within COPA's operation. COPA is a city agency separate from the department, staffed with civilians that have the authority to investigate, issue reports and findings of police misconduct without interference or influence from elected officials or city agencies. For the first time in Chicago's long history of civilian oversight, there is a legally mandated funding floor. Officials cannot compromise our efforts through underfunding. For the first time, the chief administrator can issue findings on the facts and evidence of the case without fear of termination.
for the first time, COPA attorneys and investigators must satisfactorily complete a six week training academy. For the first time, our investigative jurisdiction expanded to include improper search and seizure. Our investigative jurisdiction is administrative and yes, our burden of proof is a preponderance, but we do focus our investigative efforts on the most egregious abuses of force. COPA investigates all deaths as a result of police action, including vehicle pursuits and police custody. And this includes all firearms discharges. In the, in the past two years, we have found more shootings unjustified than in the previous 10 years, 10 years sustaining more complaints of misconduct, recommending more officers be suspended and terminated. The police board is agreeing with COPA fi COPA's findings and recommending terminations in more cases, sanctioning the department for more policy and procedural violations than in years past whether that was to address the mishandling and treatment of the transgender community, failing to drug test police officers following their involvement in a shooting, and terminating officers for engaging in a code of silence or for violating the Fourth Amendment rights of Chicagoans. But even with this progress, more is needed. And to this end, as partners, we must continue to break down those barriers that stand in the way of that and that progress. Police union contracts, they are a barrier to our progress and our ability to continue police oversight. State law requires that misconduct complaints be supported by an affidavit. That has a chilling effect. So we have more to do, a lot more to do. For instance, Illinois should institute a registry of officers terminated for cause so that they're barred from serving as police officers elsewhere. They should lose their pension if they've engaged in misconduct during the course of their performance of their duties. And so I will close with this. The best oversight and accountability system will not fix a broken and inequitable policing institution. Just like we cannot police our way out of a crime problem in this city, we can't discipline or discharge our way out of a fundamentally flawed policing system. My optimism rests, however, in the masses of people, people with actual power, and I'm not talking about political power, I'm talking about the power of the people to mobilize and speak in one voice, the voices of persons impacted and unimpacted, stating in unison that uh, enough is just enough. Police accountability, it does involve all of us, and I'm really grateful to be here with all of you. Thank you. Hi again, everyone. I'm uh, I'm glad to be able to to join you to rejoin, and I'm so sorry for the for the technical difficulties. Um, when I got cut off, I was talking about how the consent decree had provided a, a pathway for our clients, and particularly our clients who have been directly affected by police violence to stand in their power and to demand accountability from, from the police department. Um, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the history of the consent decree, what's happened with the decree so far, um, and how the, the decree relates to the, to the um, moment we're in right now, um, how it relates to the uprisings, um, and some predictions for the future of the consent decree. I should say predictions and aspirations. Um, so the, the consent decree, as I mentioned before we got cut off, arose directly out of the demands made by, by Black youth um, in the wake of the release of the Laquan McDonald video. Um, in direct response to those demands, the United States Department of Justice came to town and conduct, conducted the largest investigation of a police department ever in the history of the section. And in conducting those investigations, the uh, U.S. Department of Justice hires folks with data expertise, policing expertise, statisticians. Um, it's a large team of experts that comes in um, and has wide ranging authority to really turn, um, look, look in every document, go on ride alongs, observe trainings, um, a really comprehensive evaluation of um, what happened in policing in Chicago. 
And after that investigation, um, the DOJ released a, a report, um, and it stated, it concluded what, what Chicagoans have known for generations, that the Chicago Police Department is lawless, that it's violent, um, that it is unaccountable, that policing in Chicago produces racially disparate outcomes um, and is often outright explicitly racist. Um, there were a number of sections of the, of the report that detailed um, incredibly blatant racism from the department. And some of those sections didn't get as much coverage as, as, as did the sections that talk about the violence and the, and the use of force. So during this time, uh, Craig and myself and some of my other colleagues at Northwestern were working with a number of community leaders, including folks at Black Lives Matter of Chicago, um, folks from the West Side NAACP. Um, and we were working to come up with strategies that would ensure that we could continue to hold CPD accountable and, and to harness that political moment um, to, to produce some real transformational change. Now, this was prior to President Trump's election. And so at this point, we were making plans that there would be a Hillary Clinton Justice Department and sort of having conversations about the challenges that we would have in moving a Clinton Justice Department the way we wanted, because we thought that that Justice Department would be um, not necessarily open to all of the reforms that we wanted, right? We were in somewhat of a... Um, working in a, in a narrative that it turned out to be quite false, um, because then, of course, the election came and the Trump election changed everything. Um, he appointed Jeff Sessions as his attorney general, and Sessions uh, made it very clear from the beginning about his hostility to consent decrees, his hostility to any efforts to use the federal court to hold police departments accountable um, and just completely abdicated the responsibility that the Department of Justice has to ensure that policing is at a bare minimum constitutional. Um, so at this point, Rahm Emanuel is the mayor and he comes out publicly and says that he wants a consent decree. He wishes he could have a consent decree, but the feds won't give him one. Um, he says essentially, you know, I wanna dance, but I have no dance partner. So he was considering an out of court agreement uh, with the federal government, the out of court agreement would um, have lacked any kind of public transparency. It would have been essentially unenforceable. Um, and it also would have made it incredibly difficult for anyone else, any other entity to, uh, to achieve any sort of, of systemic pers perspective, forward-looking relief over the department. So in order to prevent this outcome, in order to prevent the city from entering into um, a sort of secret agreement with the federal government to redress the issues brought up in the DOJ findings letter, uh, we filed a lawsuit on behalf of a number of the community groups I've represented, um, including additional groups. It's an incredibly diverse coalition. And we filed the lawsuit all of making all of the allegations that were listed up in the, in the DOJ findings letter um, that were also documented in the Police Accountability Task Force report um, that our colleagues had known from decades of litigating police brutality cases throughout the city and the experiences that our client organizations had being policed and over-policed and brutalized by, by CPD. And the point of the lawsuit was to seek a consent decree. We essentially said to the city, to Rom, you want to dance? We're here. We're happy to dance with you. Um, we're we're going to be here. You know, give us this consent decree. We can do this together. Um, the city did not want to dance with us, um, completely refused to, um, to engage with us at that point, um, and came out swinging, came out swinging and, and came out fighting the decree. Um, after, so a, a several months passed, and then Lisa Madigan files a lawsuit uh, seeking a consent decree, raising a number of the, of the same, of very similar allegations that were in, in the complaint that, that we filed. And the city agreed to dance with the, with the state attorney general and agreed to negotiate a, a decree um, with her. And a few months after that, uh, the ACLU filed a lawsuit really focusing on the issues that people with disabilities face when encountering the police and also lifting up some of the issues about the explicit racism in policing in Chicago. So at this point, we've got these three different pieces of litigation all seeking the same relief, 
and the city saying that they only want to deal with the attorney general in terms of who's going to have the, the ability to enforce and negotiate the, the consent decree. So after a number of months of really uh, intense negotiations, uh, our clients and the clients represented by the ACLU earned the right, um, secured the right to both have some input in the terms of the consent decree, as well as the power to, to enforce the decree. Um, we submitted a number of, of demands uh, about specific provisions that needed to be included in the consent decree. Some of those are included, many of them are not. And um, that is one of the issues I'll talk about in a few minutes about why we still see some of the, the issues that we see with, with policing. So the consent decree is a federal court order. Um, Judge Dow is overseeing it. It has uh, provisions related to use of force policy, to accountability, um, to bias policing. Um, it, it doesn't address every single issue with related to policing, but, but the really sort of critical issues are, are included in that, in that decree. Um, the recent the, and the decree is overseen by an independent monitoring team. And the team recently submitted its second report and found that the Chicago Police Department has missed just about every deadline of note. Now, some of that's attributable to the, um, to the pandemic. Some of it is attributable to the fact that, that a few of the deadlines in the initial decree were quite ambitious. Much of it is, is attributable to the fact um, that neither the city nor the department has taken seriously the requirements in this decree. Um, and, in, and in many ways seems to view the decree, even though it's a federal court order, as containing suggestions as opposed to, to requirements. So what can we expect from a consent decree? You know, these consent decrees exist in jurisdictions all over the country. And they have a variety of, of outcomes that I think are, are, are important to, to talk through. Um, Professor Paul Butler at, at Georgetown has, has looked at this quite closely. And what he's found is, is that in Los Angeles, where Los Angeles Police Department is, of course, notorious, there was a consent decree there for many years. The data is very clear. While the consent decree was in place, there were both lower crime rate rates as well as, as a reduction in the use of force. Um, there was a consent decree in the city of Cincinnati for, for many years. And there's very strong evidence there, according to Professor Butler, that the police officers used less harmful methods um, when less harmful methods when making arrests, less instance of force. Um, in Cincinnati, there was a 56% reduction in the number of people who were injured by the police. And as Craig noted, there's some evidence of this here. We've got some strong evidence that um, that the consent decree and the political will for reform um, that, that has really been created by black and brown communities has resulted in a reduction in, in overall use of force. This is good news, right? This is, this is, a, this is important. Um, but it's also important that we know that best case scenario, even with full compliance of this decree, the best thing we can get from it is, is a harm reduction. It's not going to transform the power of the police as, as it currently states, as it currently exists, um, to inflict some of the forms of violence that are just endemic to policing. Um, and we all saw, uh, we all saw during the recent uprisings um, that it's not going to curb police power uh, in a way that's going to really change the experiences of people on the streets, unless a few things happen. One, it, some of the terms of the consent decree need to be modified. And two, the existing provisions really need to be taken, um, uh, really need to be enforced and implemented. Um, so since the uprisings, we have spoken to dozens of people who were, who were brutalized by the Chicago Police Department. This includes young people, people with disabilities, um, and, and, you know, what explains this? How could this happen, given the, all of the efforts for, for reform that, um, that have occurred in Chicago in the, in the very recent history? So the short answer is because, as I mentioned, the consent decree just doesn't sufficiently cabin the police power. Um, and it's because, and I say this with all due respect, the accountability system in the city of Chicago, the police accountability system remains broken. Um, the, the reforms necessary to stop the code of silence has not been implemented. 
And then there's also these basic issues related to the use of force, um, including most fundamentally reducing the circumstances where police interact with members of the community. As, it, as policing stands in Chicago right now, the only tool police have is an arrest, is a reactive arrest. Um, and going in and arresting somebody for, for example, a protest-related offense that's creating a perfect storm where force is going to be used, and often that force is going to be uh, going to be excessive. So there are solutions for this, and there are solutions um, for for taking away some of the power the police have to interact with people um, and putting it back in communities. Other jurisdictions have implemented programs like pre-arrest diversion, where police have uh, other tools other than arrest. Um, and are able to divert people away from the, the formal criminal justice system. Those programs both uh, keep people out of jail, which is an incredibly important outcome at any time, but especially now during a pandemic, um, and, and two, also reduce incidents of use of force. There's also incredibly simple reforms that have happened in other jurisdictions like Baltimore, where police um, are just prohibited from arresting, under most circumstances are prohibited uh, from arresting people for nonviolent offenses, things like disorderly conduct, um, and other sort of um, other sort of about, other sort of non-victim offenses. Um, the other thing that I think is is important to note here is that history matters. The history of the Chicago Police Department is critically important. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read now two two quotes that really demonstrate that. Um, the first one is from a report the city of Chicago commissioned after the, the unrest that happened in Chicago in 1919. And they convened a commission that looked at what happened, both in terms of police response to that unrest, as well as the social conditions um, that really animated the racial unrest. Um, and here's one of their findings. This is in 1919. Our attention was called strikingly to the fact that the arrests made for rioting by the police of black rioters were far in excess of the arrests made of white rioters. The failure of the police to arrest impartially at the time, whether from insufficient effort or otherwise, was a mistake and had a tendency to further incite and aggravate the black population. Finding by the city of Chicago in 1919. I'm going to quote next from the Walker Report, which is a report uh, that analyzed what happened in Chicago after the 1968 Democratic Convention. This is again direct quote. Policemen and lots of them committed violent acts far in excess of the requisite force for crowd dispersal or arrest. To read dispassionately the hundreds of statements describing at first hand the events of Sunday and Monday nights is to become convinced of the presence of what can only be called a police riot. What can only be called a police riot in 1968. Um, both of those quotes could have applied to the stories we've heard, the narratives we've captured about what happened during the recent uprising. So CPD has an incredible, and there's so many more examples of, of historical documents that document all the ways in which the Chicago Police Department um, is violent, is lawless. Um, it's been incredibly well documented. And we have this history of scandal and reform and scandal and reform. Um, and each round of reform has really failed to address the sort of roots, the core of what is rotten about policing in Chicago. Um, but I, I, like Craig, am, am hopeful um, that we are at a moment where, where, where that will change. And, and one of the reasons why the, the past efforts at reform, one of the many reasons why past efforts at reform haven't produced the kinds of outcomes necessary to transform policing is because those reforms were not grounded in the expertise and the experience of people um, who have been victimized by the Chicago Police Department, who have survived um, under the, um, the reign of the Chicago Police Department, the violence. Um, and the corruption and the lack of accountability. The people who are most likely to be targeted by violent racist policing have not been a part of crafting the solution until now. And 
at this moment, what, what we, some of what we're looking to see to really ensure um, that this time in this political moment, things will be different are the implementation of, of things like the diversion programs that I talked about. Um, those were demands that, that our coalition, our clients put forward during the consent decree process. Those are demands that are implemented again in jurisdictions throughout the country through the consent decree. Um, it's that we are at a perfect moment where those demands should be implemented, where some of the power of the police needs to be cabined. That's been demonstrated that, that, that having the power to arrest, particularly for these minor offenses, um, is really driving some of the types of excessive force and just frankly community disrespect um, that, that is, is endemic to policing. Um, the second is ensuring true community control of the police. There is a proposal for the Civilian Police Accountability Council that has been in city council uh, for a very long time. Um, it, it would in, give communities control over the policing and public safety function in much of the same way that in many places, not in Chicago, but in many places, an elected school board has control over the education system. Um, it is a, a model of ensuring that police are truly accountable uh, to those they are supposed to protect and, and serve. And then the, the, other, um, the other sort of change that, that, that needs to happen at this moment is really a diversion of resources from the policing function um, into black and brown communities. Uh, the idea, the, the sort of hashtag that we've seen about defunding the police, um, it, it's not a pipe dream. It's something that's happening in other jurisdictions. Um, and it's something that could and should happen in, in Chicago, of uh, building up the infrastructure of, of a mental health system so that police officers are not having to respond to mental health calls, um, providing a positive recreation for, for young people. Um, police officers themselves often complain about the fact that they are having to act um, as, as social workers, as school attendance officers, as case managers, um, and one of the really concrete things that we can do is take that burden off of them, invest it into the community. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up my, my remarks and I look forward to your, to your questions. So from all of us listening in, thank you so much to our panelists for all of your insights. We're gonna start the Q&A portion right now. So keep submitting questions, but we have quite a few to get started. So. One thing I'd like to start with is something that a couple of you guys mentioned, which was the role of the Fraternal Order of the Police or the Chicago Police Union in all of this, and especially their role as um, sometimes being a roadblock to real police reform and accountability. And so right now there have been ongoing multi-year negotiations for a new contract and that hasn't really gone anywhere. And so a new contract might be on the horizon. And so what should community members be looking out for? What is important to make sure is included in that new contract? And um, from your guys' perspective as panelists, what are things that are imperative that should be in the contract and that people who care about accountability should be ensuring that are included this time? I'm glad to, I'm glad to start. Um, I think what I think, Karen, and thanks for the question. I think what's most important is what's not in the contract and what needs to be excluded from the contract as opposed to what's in the contract. It's completely appropriate and right for police unions in the city to negotiate over things like wages, benefits, pensions, um, the essential work and work and work conditions. But what needs to be off the table and should never be on the table is the ability of the police unions and city to behind closed doors to negotiate away police accountability to the community and to the public. And so there are lots of provisions that right now that exist in this contract that just need to go, that need to be eliminated. They've been identified by, by the Department of Justice. They've been identified by, by the Police Accountability Task Force. They're identified in the consent decree themselves. Everyone knows what they are. They need to go. So it starts with like the one that I just, that we just had some success in defeating. Um, there shouldn't be anything in the contract that requires destruction of police misconduct records. People investigating the police can't have their hands tied behind their backs, meaning that things like one, 
have to have full ability to do pattern investigation. One of the big things that I've been talking about for years, and as Sheila talked about scandal reform, scandal, um, and not really reform, scandal reform, just or scandal, and then the failure to, to address any of the underlying conditions that have allowed this to occur. Is one thing that we know in pretty much every police scandal is that there are groups of officers who are repeatedly engaging in patterns of abuse. And when my daughter was like 10 years old, she could look at this data and would jump off the page and she'd be able to say, here's where we need to be looking. Here's where we need to be investigating because relatively small percentage of the force is responsible for the lion's share of abuse. But this isn't a question, as Sheila said, as of a few bad apples. It is a system, of, if we're talking about the tree, the apple tree that needs to be pulled out root and branch because we have allowed, or I should say the city of Chicago has done, engaged in an incredible amount of work to turn a blind eye to groups of racist, brutal officers to enable them to get away with this forever and ever and ever. One of the best things that we can do in terms of eliminating that stuff in the police conduct is allow and ensure that the city itself and also people in the community can actually engage in pattern investigation and do what actually police departments are supposed to do very well, investigate officers engaged in patterns. And there are lots of other provisions, things like you gotta get rid of, you gotta get rid of um, allow anonymous complaints, um, can't require things like a sworn affidavit when people are already at risk of being retaliated against to give a complaint, um, to enable people investigating the complaint to, to take prompt statements, require prompt statements, to do basic things in investigations 101 that you do. You separate officers from one another when someone's, when an officer has killed someone or engaged in unlawful, or potentially unlawful use of force. You separate, you keep the cameras on until they're actually interviewed. Why? And this is what you do in almost any investigation. You talk, separate witnesses. We want to know just what this person knows and saw and has seen. And what we also know in Chicago is that there is a deep code of silence that continues to exist. And what happens instead is that allowing officers to get together, get their stories straight, work together and collude, that's what's allowed by the collective bargaining agreement. Do things like require that officers must give, not take out any provisions that impede the police department, COPA, um, and any agency, CPAC, investigating police officers from being able to do prompt, require prompt interviews immediately after these incidents occur. And those are just a few, um, but the bottom line is just got to get rid of every aspect of this police contract that impedes accountability, and impedes honesty and openness with the public. It's just that simple. It's been one of the primary barriers to any kind of accountability or fairness in policing and has not served actually police officers well. Hi, um, I have to certainly echo uh, everything that Craig said as the agency that's actually responsible for doing these investigations. Um, those are real, real barriers. Um, uh, we have found members of the, the union, they know they have to make their officer available, but you know, they'll say, oh, we've got all these scheduling conflicts and it'll take too long in order for them to produce them to even sit for an interview. And so, and that's just one example. So I don't want to repeat anything that, that Craig mentioned, but some of the other things that, that need to be prohibited is the ability to review their body-worn camera before they sit for an interview. I, I, I mean, that's, that's something that should not be permitted. Um, they should be required to report misconduct. Officers should not be able to allow other officers to engage in misconduct and not have a duty to, to report. Um, there also needs to be greater transparency. We should be able to just disclose officers that are under investigation. Uh, there should be permanent retention of their misconduct complaints. And I feel very, very strongly that an officer that uses his authority uh, inappropriately engages in excessive force under color of law should not be able to keep their pension. And those are things that should just be absolute bars. I'll just jump in uh, briefly to, to co-sign everything that Craig and, and Sydney said, and also just to emphasize the seriousness of this. Um, when the DOJ conducted its, its investigations, it actually found that provisions of the, of the contract 
animate constitutional violations. I mean, it's, it's the, the, these these provisions have created the cone of silence. The code of silence has created um, so much uh, violence against uh, people in the Chicago community at the hands of police officers. Uh, so these issues in the contract negotiations. Um, may feel to some abstract and removed to the issues of of race and violence and policing. Um, but we've got very strong evidence that so much of what's wrong with policing in Chicago is directly tied into what's happened in these labor negotiations. Great, thank you all so much. So um, one thing that we've received a lot of questions about is regarding the consent decree and to sort of sum up a few questions, one thing that we've seen so far in the consent decree's existence is that there's rules about, you know, you're not allowed to make biased decisions if you're on the force, but we see that bias still is really pervasive in all aspects of policing in Chicago. Or, you know, there's rules that you are supposed to report every time you point a weapon at a civilian, but shootings still happen at a rate that far exceeds what they should. And so to what extent is it possible to just rule make your way out of a really systemic problem in policing? and? you know, what are changes that can be made that actually work? And then what are some of the things that are, you know, attempting to get at the problem but aren't really solving them? Um, in terms of going beyond the consent decree and not just making guidelines and rules that need to be followed, but enacting real change that can ensure that these guidelines, like in terms of bias, for example, have a real impact instead of just being words on a page. Craig, you want me to, to, to take that? Um, Go ahead, sorry, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'll um I'll kind of give a, a couple of thoughts and then you can you can fill in. Um, I mean, one of the important limitations of a, of the consent decree is that, um, and of this consent decree in particular is is that there are not specific um, outcome requirements in the consent decree, meaning that there isn't a provision that says something like lethal force needs to be re reduced by 99.9% uh, .9 um, and uh, overall use of force needs to be reduced by a certain number. Um, what we, we are going to be using um, some of those metrics to help us evaluate the success of the, of the, of the consent decree. Um, but in, in these types of efforts, when we are focused on, on changing both systems and policies and practices, um, what that means is the actions of individual officers uh, can't, often can't be implicated for enforcement actions. The actions of uh, critical mass of officers certainly can. Um, and what we are, what, through our enforcement powers, what we are increasingly focusing on um, are some of, these, some of these outcomes, sort of looking at how have the policy changes that are required by the consent decree affected people's interactions with police department and the way CPD is operating on the streets, meaning that, that it's, it's not enough uh, for to have a pretty policy that doesn't actually result in, in concrete changes. Collecting the information and data needed to make that case for enforcement is a, is a heavy lift and it's something that's going to, that, is, that will take time. Um, so those are sort of my initial thoughts in, in response to that, that some of it is just inherent in, in systemic litigation like this. Um, and then some of it is also about what's required to, to work up proof of the ongoing systemic violations. Just, just to build off of what Sheila said, policy matters and policy matters a lot. There's no doubt about it. And one of the things that the consent decree, I hope, and that we can build this up to do is to fundamentally change Chicago police policy when it comes particularly to police when it comes particularly to police violence. Um, but while policy matters, culture trumps policy every time. And um, what we've seen in Chicago is that there are also areas in which, you know, CPD policy is okay. It's not terrible, but it's not worth the paper it's printed on because no one's enforcing it. And Police have, and there has, there is the absence of any kind of culture or reality of accountability. Of accountability. So, as Sheila said, I think one of the key things about and with respect to the consent decree is not just looking at what's changing on paper, because that's easy to change the paper. 
Um, that's done all the time, but to really see and to measure what's happening on the ground is are these things that are being put into paper that say police officers, you may not, you are prohibited from shooting anyone unless it is absolutely necessary to save life. Now, it can say that, but the question then is, is that then what's happening then being enforced all the way up to the ground? And I guess, and this is really to echo something that Sheila said in, in her opening remarks, I mean, what's, what's typically offered in panels like these are calls for things like, we'll change this policy, more body cams, better training, calls for community policing. And, and I'm not here to dog any of that stuff. Um, but the emphasis on, on those and just policy as primary remedies, I think as Sheila really highlighted all too well, masks the reality of the problem. And it serves to deny the reality of the experience of all too many black and brown folks in Chicago. Because it's not, if only police and the black community had more positive interactions and knew one another better, we just understood one another better, everything would all be kumbaya. While, again, communication and empathy are good things, the reason why folks from the streets is not our failure to understand one another. It's because of police abuse, it's because of racism, it's because of dishonesty, lying, denial, secrecy, impunity, and our state of mass incarceration. And so any real solution has to speak fundamentally to the core of those problems. One just side note with respect to policy and racism, because, I, because back to all policy, you know, tends to be drafted, and not just tends to be, is drafted like in a way of assuming the complete opposite of reality, assuming a non-racist world, assuming a non-racist society, assuming a colorblind police department when we all know the reality and have known for decades and decades and decades, generations long before mine, to mine and those that follow me, that racism is as real and present as ever. And so one of the things that I think need to be asked with respect to each and every police policy as it's being drafted is not drafting in the assumption of the absence of racism, but to ask the question each and every time as we're drafting something, how will racism and the reality of racism, both in society and the police force, impact this? What do we need to do in this policy, in the supervision of it, in its accountability, in its training, that actually accounts for that and being conscious of that? We're never going to address the reality of racism unless first we name it, and then we actually take that on head on. And so I'm just using that example because the question went to things about policy, and that's the point is that that perspective really needs to be ever present in everything that we do if we're really trying to fundamentally challenge racism in the police department. If I could, if I could just quickly add to that, um, and it and it's one of the things that we see in our in our cases. So. Um, when an officer is done you know, for the day, their supervisor is supposed to take a look at their body-worn camera, take a look at their reports. If they did a meaningful review of their body-worn camera and looked at the words on the paper, they have the opportunity to say, what you wrote here is not what happened on body-worn camera and stop it right then and there. To, Gre to Craig's point, there are policies and procedures that this is supposed to happen but it's not leading to a correction in the paper. There are use of force reports that are just woefully inconsistent with the body one camera, but it's been signed by a sergeant. It's been signed by a lieutenant. And then we get a complaint and it's like, well, how did this even get here to this point? And so it is more than just having the policy in place. It is making sure that law enforcement, that the police officers themselves are policing themselves because I may never get that complaint. That complaint may never come to COPA. The other thing that I think needs to happen when we talk about um, changing policing, and it really goes to the cultural aspect, there is a belief, a, we call it contempt of cop. If I tell you to come over here and you don't, now I'm gonna make you come over. That, 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 that just, can't happen. People have a right to run away from the police. But every time the police, someone runs away from the police, the longer they chase, 
the, the, the higher the likelihood that force is going to be used. And sometimes these officers don't know why they chased them in the first place. And so this, this philosophy of contempt of cop has just simply ha has to stop. And I think if we can start addressing that, but part of that is when the sergeants and the lieutenants and law enforcement are looking at the paperwork. The paperwork is not matching and that's their opportunity because the policies, they can be the best policies in the world, but if they're not held accountable to the policies, nothing is going to change. Great, so we've gotten a lot of questions specifically about COPA and for you, Sydney. And so I'm just gonna ask one of these real quick, um, especially since it's something that's really timely. So in the past couple of weeks, um, as protests have swept the city of Chicago, we've seen a lot of reports of police using excessive force against protesters. And you know, I was speaking earlier with the state's attorney's office who were saying that they were starting to open some of their own investigations into those um, independent of COPA, but I know that you guys are also working on this. And so is there anything that you can share with us right now um, more broadly about how those invest what you found from those investigations and how they're going and you know what are the findings from the last couple of weeks of protests and how police have been engaging with protesters? Sure. So um a couple a couple things. Um yes we have been um to the extent that we don't compromise both our investigation and the criminal investigation, we have been working um, with both the Cook County State's Attorney's Office as well as the FBI who has taken on some of these cases as well. Um, but one of the things that I have to just tell you personally that I've seen, you know, when we talk about excessive force, that starts from the premise that some level of force is acceptable. I have seen far too many cases, far too many videos, where there was no level of force that was even acceptable. That was that should have happened. And so not only are we investigating things where potentially some level of force might have been appropriate, and now we have to judge it on the spectrum, we have our fair share of cases where simply force was not necessary at all. And that is a different discussion. So that's one of the observations that we're seeing. One of the other observations that we're seeing is, um, that that officers were, in my opinion, uh, willingly shielding their identity. And the consequence of that is for some of these cases where the force has been either excessive or just outright should not have happened, we are challenged with our ability to investigate. And this is when that code of silence culture hurts us the most because other officers are standing by, but trying to get them to stand up, even if they wanted to, it, the culture within policing doesn't support the ability of an officer to say, yeah, that was this guy or that was that guy. And so two of the big observations are um, that, uh, the inability to identify officers is going to be challenging, that we have seen force that was not excessive. The force just should not have happened in the first place. Now, what we have right now, we've got about 140 cases that we have identified that are exclusively within COPUS jurisdiction. These are uh, excessive force cases. They're verbal abuse cases that are biased in nature. Um, we have a host of denial of counsel um, allegations as well, um, as well as Fourth Amendment complaints. And so we are uh, investigating those cases, but, you know, kind of to, to, to Craig's point, you know, one of the things that COPA has been challenged to be able to do is actually conduct those pattern and practice investigations. Um, and we've been challenged because all of our investigative resources, and as a matter of fact, all of our staffing resources have been devoted exclusively to the investigation of the complaints that we have. I mean, right now we have 1,600 open investigations and um, uh, the staffing level is, is, is challenged to get through all of those cases. But we are uh, 
working and trying to identify how we can carve out some resources to look at some of these matters on a more global global level, particularly for those instances where we know we won't be able to reach a sustained finding against an individual officer, but the actions and the conduct itself was clearly outside of policy and arguably criminal. Great, so opening it back up again to a broader question, especially um, for the other two panelists. So. I know especially, I've talked to you about this before, Craig, but one thing that you've been really involved in is having a um, citizen accountability board that is, um, in addition to COPA, one in which civilians can be a little bit more involved in the police accountability process. And I know that the CPAC proposal is one of those, and then there's GAPO, which has sort of different um, like powers for the body that would result from that. and so. Just for people who don't know about what the different differences are between those two policies and then how those are working their way through city council right now, um, I guess, can you explain a little bit the need for a body like that, what the progress is on attempts to get that implemented and the two proposals and how they might be faring? That's a complicated question. I'm gonna try, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna try and I'll try to see if I can do it short. That's the big thing. I was wearing a shirt that Sheila made fun of me yesterday the day before that says say less and I'm gonna try. Um, <laughs> we start with, um, I mean, basically the, my, the whole intro to the presentation talks about, and as Sheila and really everyone has highlighted, is the critical need for community, direct community power oversight over the police. And among the things that have given Sheila and I and others some of the most hope in terms of what's different or what's potentially different this time is that people who have been first, the folks who've been most impacted, health folks with lived experience most impacted by police abuse, um, and also who have been traditionally most excluded from any conversations, much less power over the policies, the very policies that, that have resulted and caused such abuse, um, are, have not because the city has wanted um, or the powers that be have wanted folks to, but that, that power has been claimed, demanded, and reinforced and widely recognized as a necessity if there's going to be real safety um, and any hope at um, the concept of police accountability in Chicago. So CPAC, um, CPAC is something, and I'll, I'll be blunt about it, I, I support because I find it's the most, and actually, if I were looking just around the entire nation, people talk about civilian oversight a lot, but it's, actually in terms of real control, real power, and independence from City Hall, um, talked about abstractly, but doesn't really exist anywhere um, in full reality. CPAC actually makes this real. Um, it puts the real power into people and communities who've been most impacted. It tries to create something that as best as possible, and there's no perfect way of doing it, that's independent from the police, independent from City Hall, and something that has real power, real power in terms of determining police policy and practice, real power over the supervision and hiring of, um, including the head of COPA, um, and so that COPA is ultimately, would be ultimately accountable to a community controlled agency as opposed to first and foremost accountable to the mayor. And then, and, um, and, and similarly, something that is ultimately and fully transparent so that it is truly the people's body so that everything about the police department, um, about what can be shared, will be shared publicly and so that the broader community can be involved and have full hearings on, on this. There is a, another and competing ordinance um, called GAPA that comes from a very similar and starts from a very similar place um, with respect to having real voice and real power um, when it comes to police, when it comes to police oversight in Chicago. But the vision of where GAPA started, and um, even then it was a far weaker, um, far weaker um, ordinance than that of CPAC, 
has been watered down now so much such that um, as, a, as, as it exists right now, and I hope it becomes far better, um, all ultimate power doesn't reside with GAPA, but it resides still fundamentally at City Hall, power over everything, even including who is GAPA and who makes up GAPA. And um, that seems just like too much of the same old of what we've seen again and again and again. And this is a time where while GAPA would on paper look to be, or at least the version of GAPA right now, would look to be a, a, an improvement over what we have, um, let's not waste this moment. <laughs> Let's not waste this opportunity to not think big, to not dream big, to not actually do something that fundamentally can address and redistribute power from the police to the community, as opposed to create just yet another body that has the power to um, give its opinions and to share who should be the police chief, who should head COPA, who should be on the police board, but actually no real power at the end of the day beyond the power of suggestion and the suggestion of making that public. One thing that I do want to say about GAPA, and I think the strongest part of GAPA, which is something still that's being fought by Mayor Lightfoot at this point, is the power to actually have final approval over police policy and practice, which ironically isn't anything new because the police board right now has the final say-so over, um, over in approving Chicago police policy, but it's just been a power that's never been exercised by that board. It's been a rubber stamp. So that's something that actually GAP has claimed and something that I think should be uncontroversial, but back to what's changed and what's stayed the same. Um, at present, the mayor is still fundamentally fighting, um, fighting even that most basic power of a community-based body having the power to approve and propose and final say so over um, the very policies and practices that govern and govern the police. That's what it means in terms of police direct accountability to the community. Uh, I'll just briefly add to, to Craig's point, and, and he alluded to this, that, that there are best practices for, for police accountability. Um, and those best practices require an accountability system that is fully independent of any political operation, um, that is rigorous, that, that, that really has uh, rigor and accuracy in terms of the way the investigations uh, happen, and that is accountable uh, to the communities, and particularly black and brown communities that are most likely uh, to be targeted by, by police violence. And CPAC checks every one of those boxes in a way that is critically important in order to make th this, this round of transformation real um, and also specific to the context in Chicago and the history of Chicago, uh, both Chicago politics and Chicago policing. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have time for about two more questions. So. Um, I think the next thing that I'd like to talk about a little bit is, okay, so a complaint has been made and now what? And so one of the um, big problems that advocates have pointed out is the role of mediation in which a police officer can basically plea down to lower consequences once they've been found um, guilty of misconduct. And a ProPublica investigation, I think, found that somewhere around 80, 85% of cases, um, officers appealed their um, accountability um, measures and were able to get reduced punishment or were able to get their punishment completely overturned. And something that one of the listeners really wanted to touch on is specifically in regarding COPA's investigation into the Killa Muhammad case um, is that uh, it was found that the officer was guilty of shooting a disabled black teenager and lying about it, but then the punishment that was agreed upon was like a settlement and only a short suspension. And so what can be done about these measures like mediation or you know, just having police officers being really successful in appealing sentences or consequences and basically having those just go away after all the work of doing, you know, having someone file a complaint, having an investigation, bringing stakeholders to the table and trying to hold people accountable um, where it often sort of falls apart at the final stage. Thank you. So, um, 
So uh, the I guess I would say a couple of things. Um, in right now, um, there is no mediation program. Um, following the creation of, of COPA, mediation has, um, has been placed on hold. It is being revamped and redeveloped in accordance with the consent decree. Um, as developed, it will have principles in, in restorative justice, bringing the officer and the community, um, bring the officer and the, and, and the aggrieved person together, and hopefully also addressing the harm to the community. Um, but we're not, we're not there yet. That is actually being, being developed. And it's not, it's not intended to be developed in a way that results in some sort of plea bargaining agreement. Um, but what I can tell you is when it comes to the discipline recommendations of, of police officers, whether it's this particular case, Khalil Muhammad, or whether it's any other case, there are right now, there's no real standards upon which to set, set discipline. Um, and each discipline right now is based on, you know, the facts of the case, whether there's any aggra aggravating and mitigating circumstances. And what I will say is, you know, when we talk about discipline, um, I think mitigating factors do come into place. I think aggravating factors do come in, come into place. Um, and so those are, are those are some of the ways in which discipline is carried out. But yes, there is, because the disciplinary process is part of a contractual agreement, there are times where those things, those disciplines can, can change as time goes on. You know, one of the things that I would like to see happen, uh, whether it's through CPAC, whether it's through GAPA, um, or even through, through the collective bargaining agreement, the discipline should be set by the standards. If the community believes that an out of justice, an a out of policy shooting should be automatic termination, then that should be the standard. If uh, an out of policy shooting that results in the death of someone should be um, an automatic termination, then that should be, be the standards. Um, and so I think that there's a way moving forward to develop a discipline system and structure that um, involves the community so that the discipline that is met out is consistent with the values of the community. So I'll, I'll talk some about the, the purpose of mediation in this, in this context. And, and mediation in the context of, of police accountability uh, was never meant to address these serious allegations of police misconduct, like the use of lethal force, like sexual misconduct, um, like domestic violence. Uh, the, the idea about mediation is, was to address you know, serious, I mean, all police misconduct is serious, but the kind of misconduct, uh, thing, things like a um, rudeness, uh, things, th things sort of that, that don't really give rise to these very serious violations of, of policy. Um, so one of the, the things that we will be looking for um, through the consent decree process is, is some very clear requirements about what types of uh, complaints can be sent to mediation. Um, and there needs to be some, some, some restrictions on that. Um, to ensure that police officers are not using and abusing the mediation process to escape accountability. Uh, you know, obviously, restorative justice is an important concept, both in public safety and, and also in, in redressing interpersonal harm. Um, but using the idea of restorative justice uh, as a shield uh, to prevent real accountability for police officers um, just makes the whole system into, into a farce. So, so those are going to be the changes that we'll be looking looking for. Um, and, and the good news is there are models of effective community police mediation programs uh, where restorative justice models have been used, have been used successfully. But one of the things all those models have in common are really strict requirements about the kinds of cases that are appropriate for mediation. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for about one more question. So this is a pretty broad question, a combination of 
things that many people have asked about over the course of this um, panel discussion, which is what are sort of the limits of how far reform can take us, right? It's not just a problem with, for example, leadership or with policy or with outreach or not enough community policing. Um, this is a really systemic problem that pervades pretty much every corner of the institution of policing where you know, use of force is excessive, racial bias is rampant. And so what are sort of the outer edges of what we can expect from reform efforts, um, especially given that no police department in the country has been successful in reforming their police to the point where you know these problems don't exist. Um, and then also, what are your guys' thoughts as panelists on you know some of the uh, suggestions that we have been hearing in the policy landscape nationally about things like replacing some functions of police officers with social workers or you know other institutions like that, which also can replace or can sorry replicate some of the you know problems that criminalization and policing causes just under a different institution. So I'll, I'll, I'll start first. Um, and uh, for me, um, police reform requires a, a just a, a fundamental change in why police exist. Right now, police officers themselves and the community looks at them as, you know, well, not maybe not all communities, but it's about they're, they're there to maintain law and they're there to maintain order. And as long as that is the philosophy, that is the culture in which, you know, policing is carried out, that is not going to lead to um, a more procedurally just policing system. To me, police officers must see themselves and see their responsibility as they're there to maintain the peace, not to see who they can arrest. And, it's, and, 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 and until they realize that they are actually problem solvers, because so many calls for service are not criminal violations, and they have to come to that, that corner, that house, that school, wherever it is, they have to understand that they're going there to solve a problem, that they're there to maintain the police and not look for someone to arrest. Um, and as to, and I can't remember, what was your second question? Oh, basically, I mean, a lot of people, one thing a lot of people have been asking about is, or one thing that has actually, just to be explicit about it, has been really gaining traction nationally is the concept of abolition, right? Do we even need police at all? And a lot of, there's been a lot of confusion, I think, with new abolitionists and people who are interested in these ideas around what that even means. And some of those ideas are, okay, we should have social workers just replace the police, but then that it's not necessarily a solution if the social workers are just replicating carceral logics and are still, you know, mm -hmm in this model of punishment that really doesn't work for anyone. And so just talking about what the limits are around replacing the police with social workers or you know, saying that the police need responsibilities to be taken on by other institutions, which might not even solve the problem because it's not like racism is something that only affects police officers. Sure, and that's a really, really big question. So I'm gonna give a, a, a limited answer um, to that question. And But when we're talking about defunding the police, I think we have to start from the standpoint of what do we want them to do and how much money do they need to do it? And because if, if we're defunding the police because we don't like how they police, merely giving them less money just means less officers policing poorly. That doesn't change. Defunding the police doesn't get you a reformed police department. It doesn't get you an equitable police department and doesn't get you officers that don't engage in uh, unjustified uses of force. It just gets you less of them. And so we have to start with what do we want them to do and then fund them accordingly, train them accordingly and hold them accountable for what we have asked them to do. Um, and that's, that's a monumental task right now. Um, but I do believe that we are better positioned today to bring that about literally, in my opinion, than we were before, Feb uh, before May 29th when all of these protests started. 
so the the idea of defunding the police is not just giving less money to the police and allowing police to sort of carry on um, the the racist, unaccountable violence as as usual. Uh, the The idea behind defunding the police is is about uh, diverting resources from the policing function um into the investments in communities that we know create safe, healthy, peaceful communities. Um, so it's about radically reimagining both budgeting priorities um, and the way we approach public safety. So the, the reality is, is that the, the thinkers um, and, and the, the people who have been doing the hard work of, of laying out a vision for abolition, um, almost, entirely, uh, almost entirely Black women, people like uh, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, like Marion Kaba, I encourage people to seek out their, their writing because a lot of the answers to the, to, to the questions that are being posed um, are, are addressed there. And I think it's really important to underscore that the demand is not just take money away from the police. It's also about imagining, it's also about this, this reinvestment. Um, and that is something that is, it's entirely possible. And we've seen it happen um, in, in microcosms uh, in the prison system. Um, I myself worked, uh, I worked uh, around issues of juvenile imprisonment in Mississippi. And there we closed down a number of youth prisons, reinvested those resources in the community. Um, and what that did was fundamentally shape how young people um, were involved in the, in, in the public safety system and, and in, in, in policing as well. So it's, it's possible, and we're seeing this move because of the increasing recognition that reform is insufficient, that you cannot reform an institution um, that, is, that sort of has as its roots and its historical roots uh, racism and the maintenance of white supremacy. Um, it's a system that just cannot be reformed. Um, and that's why we are using the, the consent decree and the work that we're involved in to, to really push for um, a reallocation of the power from the policing function um, to black and brown communities in Chicago. Let me jump in as well, just to, just to follow up. I mean, one of the fears that I have in, in this conversation is when, when and using the words like monumental task, that, um, that when people think, wow, this is just too big, then it tends to lead to paralysis where people just Put up their throw up their hands and this is just too big, etc. And the point is, that this is actually really concrete. As Sheila said, and as Sydney said, there are real things that we can do and we can do now. How much, even to begin with, it would matter if just please quit it. Literally, just talk about less less policing in this in this aspect. Stop killing, brutalizing, harassing, stopping, arresting so many black folks. Stop all these truly unnecessary negative encounters between um, between folks in the community and police. Um, I mean that any real solution um, and, and has to begin with questioning the very role that police have played in America and in Chicago, and in particular the role that police have played in the control of black bodies, from slave patrols, from the origins of police in America, black codes, Jim Crow's, to the present state of mass incarceration, where we are the world's number one incarcerator by far. We arrest someone every three seconds in America. And yet, every northern country is far more safe than we are. So we know it's not working. So I guess I start with just, it's difficult for change to occur unless we can begin to imagine something different, unless we can begin to imagine. That's you know the hope that even I see in, in this messed up COVID period where so many people, including people I love around me, are sick and dying, losing their jobs, losing ability to support family. But it's stopping stuff. And in that stopping, we can begin to imagine doing things better. And when I close my eyes, and I think this is, um, we all have our own visions, but when I close my eyes and imagine something better, I see a world in which there really is accountability to the community, one that has acknowledged and grappled with racism, denial, impunity, where People in the role of police or public safety are overseen by and accountable by the communities that have been most impacted by police abuse, and not simply agents of those who have the most power, the most money. 
where we're committed, all of us, to protecting the least among us, the most vulnerable, where we treat everyone with dignity, everybody with respect. And I guess I see a world, and this is similar to what Sheila is, where we invest in our people. And so much of the money that we spend in locking people up, in arresting people, in bringing a hammer to a solution that makes everyone look like a nail in which a hammer, as police officers said for years and years, doesn't belong. Um, but where we invest in people and, and the best solutions are jobs, education, hope, safe place to live, enough healthy food to eat, place to work, contribute, drug alcohol treatment, mental health services, human services. That's how we make one another safe far more than putting more and more dollars into something that hasn't worked, and something that has affirmatively hurt people. If we can't imagine it, we'll never make it. And I'm inspired by the young black folk who really challenge me too in my own beliefs and who are leading the way, both in forcing us to acknowledge their realities and also to imagine something better. And I hope we all take this opportunity to do just that. Yeah, definitely. Always good to you know and uh, talk about police accountability and reform and things like that with a call to read the work of so many people who have been working on things like abolition for so long and have been such thought leaders in this. So I completely co-sign um, Sheila's advice to read up on these things and figure out you know, what abolition really means. But thank you all so much for attending today. We really appreciate you joining us. And thank you so much to our wonderful panelists who imparted so much knowledge on us and answered a lot of great questions. So that's all the time we have for today, one minute left. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending and for being a part of this really important discussion right now. So have a good weekend and thanks for being a part of this.